Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out today to the, um, the Green Job Social Justice uh, panel conversation. Uh, I'm Ana Baptista. I am the chair of the Environmental Policy and Sustainability Management uh, Program at the Milano School, and I'm also the associate director at the Tishman Environment and Design Center. Um, but I'm here today to welcome all of you to this exciting panel. Um, First, I want to thank the sponsors of this panel, which uh, include the Environmental Studies Undergraduate Program, the Environmental Policy Sustainability Management Graduate Program Career Services, both from Milano and university-wide, um, and the Tishman Environment and Design Center. So we had a lot of great sponsors. Um, yay, thank you. <laughs> um, and this is a very important event. I'm glad to see so many folks here um, in attendance because uh, we know that in a few weeks our students will be graduating, right? Like walking down, getting their diplomas, whether they're graduate or undergraduates. Um, and they're all anxious, right, about the jobs, you know, the, the whole prospect of, of getting their first job for some of them or others, uh, changing careers and finding their way in a whole new field, um, so it can feel very overwhelming. And today's panel, I think, is important because not only is it overwhelming the prospect of finding a job, but the environmental challenges that we face today are so daunting, right? Things like climate change um, are sort of game changers in the field of the you know, green jobs. And um, we have to prepare our students for the challenges that are ahead, right? The crisis, uh, environmental crisis is very complex um, and it requires a quite great deal of understanding of complexity. Um, and so our students are famous for not being interested in just siloed little small things, right? Our students are they, they care about everything, <laughs> and they care about it deeply. Um, they don't just want to study one environmental issue on its own. They want to understand the political policy design, all the implications of those issues. Um, and that's good, because the environmental issues that we face are complex, and they're going to require that level of interdisciplinarity. Um, so we hope that we're preparing them for that world that's very diverse, very complex, very interdisciplinary. Um, because we know the problems are demanding, um, and we know that the future of green jobs is going to be demanding, right? That it's changing and redefining what it means to be in a professional in the environmental sector. You know, what does it mean to even be a green job today is very different than maybe 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Um, so we're really looking forward to the insights of our panelists who can share with us the real world perspective of what that green sector looks like uh, as we go into this brave new world together of uh, a very dynamic, um, ever-changing and exciting field of environment and sustainability. So I want to introduce Kristen Reynolds, who, she's the reason why we're all here, really. She uh, developed this idea and put a lot of effort uh, and a lot of dedication to bringing this panel and this job fair to our students, and it's an invaluable contribution to our community. So I really want to sincerely thank her. Thank you, Kristen, for all your efforts. <laughs> Uh, I know that our students are going to benefit greatly from, from the investment you've made here in getting us all together. Um, and Kristen Reynolds is a visiting professor, assistant professor in environmental studies and food studies, and a faculty affiliate of the Tishman Environment and Design Center here at the New School. She's also a lecturer at Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Uh, and her work focuses on the intersection of urban food systems, environment, social justice. She has a book coming out this summer, Beyond the Kale, Urban Agriculture and Social Justice Activism in New York City, a great book, you should get it. <laughs> it's gonna be published by University of Georgia Press this summer. Um, and her current research examines environmental justice aspects of policies and funding programs supporting rooftop agriculture and green infrastructure in New York City. Um, and that work is grounded in participatory action research. So very important type work that she's doing uh, on urban agriculture. She has a PhD in geography and an MS in international agricultural development from UC Davis. So thank you, Kristen. And she, Kristen's gonna introduce our panelists. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Anna. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. It's very exciting to see so many faces in the room. Uh, before we continue, I want to reiterate thanks to the program sponsors, as well as a number of individuals who have also been instrumental in putting this event together and the previous networking event together as well. Um, our environmental studies program manager, Brandon Fisher, who's sadly leaving the university for Mexico soon, uh, was instrumental in putting this uh, event together, as were uh, staff at Mulatto Career Services, Carol Anderson and Sharon Reed, R. Adler, who works in student advising, and Marissa Lobianco, who is the Associate Director of Career Services here at the new school. So I want to also thank these wonderful people for putting together this event with me tonight. Um, before I introduce our panelists and begin to ask them questions, I wanted to just give a few other additional wor words of inspiration or thoughts behind this event itself. And so the, the idea for the event really grew out of an interest of bringing together a group of experts who are working in, field, in environmental fields, in green jobs, um, who are thinking about social justice and can talk both about their experiences in these fields, but also the ways that they see social justice integrated, integrated into environmental careers. Things that we can think about as we as faculty are looking at student um, career pathways, students can think about as they're planning out their academic careers and what happens after graduation, uh, and ways that we can really nurture this intersection between environment and social justice when we're thinking about careers. Uh, there are a few different definitions of green jobs, and I know that many of my students are here and know that I like definitions, so I'm going to read off a few. Um, one is that these are green economic activities, activities that produce goods or deliver services that in increase energy efficiency or gen generate renewable energy. A second kind of concept within this realm of green jobs is a green employer, one that is engaged in a targeted green economic activity, such as retrofitting buildings or generating power from wind and energy. Here again, we have this energy focus. And then a green employee, a worker primarily engaged in producing those products and services, such as a photovoltaic installer or an installation worker or a wind turbine assembler. We're going to hear a lot more about different types of green jobs from our panelists. Um, but what I want to emphasize with these definitions that is that I think that in some circles, these are commonly understood as elements of, of the green economy. But these definitions leave out two related and very critical aspects of sustainability, social justice and social equity. I think that this omission stems from a dominant, though I believe increasingly outdated, view of environment and sustainability that includes these very things, social equity, social justice, and sometimes even people themselves. Sustainability is often discussed as a three-legged stool of economic, environmental, and social, but the social justice leg has too often been left out of this equation. On the other hand, environmental justice as a movement a field of, and a field of scholarship brings equity and social power back into thinking about sustainability. As many of you know, and as our panelists will speak about today, and environmental justice leaders emphasize that we cannot have sustainability without justice and equity. We can't talk about environment without people. And we can't think that we can solve environmental degradation or reach sustainability without thinking about toxics in our water, about thinking about climate change and the effects, the inequitable effects that it has in different types of communities. We can't think about these things without addressing underlying questions and issues of environmental racism, political disenfranchisement, economic disenfranchisement, when it comes to environmental policy, decision making, and to bring it back to our topic of today, um, employment and careers. So if, I think, if we want to think about this event and these, uh, these suite of events tonight, um, as far as bringing these theories of environmental justice and sustainability into thinking about green jobs and the green economy, we can extend that thinking into this conversation. And so those who are interested and aware of, of this whole field know that many organizations actually do this, right? They're extending this idea of environmental and green jobs to think about social and, and economic questions as well. Uh, green for All is a well-known organization that's been around for decades, founded by Van Jones, Sustainable South Bronx, um, led by Majora Carter. These are organizations that are well-known for their integration of social justice and equity questions into creating green and environmental jobs and careers for people, um, and particularly working to build inclusive green economies that both 
focus on environmental sustainability, but also explicitly try to help people come out of poverty well, um, and address equity questions at neighborhood as well as on, on up to global scales. So whether, as we'll hear from our panelists shortly, this is through urban forestry, parks, recreation, urban agriculture, sustainable design, or other initiatives to address environmental degradations, we can think about green jobs and social justice as those which simultaneously address questions of equity and uh, sustainability. And those are the themes of our panel discussion tonight. So with that, I will move to introducing our panelists. So I'll just work this way. So first of all, we have Devashu Ghosh. She is a clean energy and sustainability strategist at Envi Energy and Environmental Management Consulting, right? Um, she has extensive experience in the energy sector and as a strategist works on large scale projects of complex nature in the areas of microgrid feasibility analysis, carbon emissions and abatement plans, energy savings, plan savings plans, sustainability strategy and reporting. Um, we also have the honor of saying that she earned her master's degree in environmental policy and sustainability management here at the New School. So she brings both her expertise as a professional and her perspective as a um, graduate level graduate of one of our New School environmental programs. So welcome. Next to her, we have Rashid Hislop who is the School Gardens Outreach Coordinator with the New York City Parks and Recreation and Green Thumb Program. Uh, he works in schools in Manhattan and the Bronx. He's had the pleasure of watching the School Gardens Initiative in New York City grow from its infancy to where it is today with over 500 school gardens registered with its Grow to Learn project. He joined the Green Thumb office in 2007 where he started as a Community Gardens Outreach Coordinator and he holds a master's degree in, at my alma, alma mater in my same program from International Agricultural Development um, from the University of California, Davis, where he also researched food justice organizations throughout the United States. Thank you. Next to Rashid, we have Sophie Plitt, who is an urban forester. She has a passion for connecting urban communities to trees and enhancing New York City's local forest. She's worked for the New York Restoration Project in urban ag, urban ag organization, Tree Kit, and also the New York City Depart Department of Parks and Recs, Rec. Um, she managed and planned tree project, projects in New York's public spaces. And she is also an alumna of the, of the new school in the undergraduate environmental studies program in, I believe, 2011, is that right? She earned her bachelor's degree in that year. And I had the pleasure of co-supervising her thesis on urban forestry and environmental justice. She, was, she too is also a content expert and can speak to how she's been able to translate her new school degree into working in environmental fields. And then, oh, we clap for everybody. And finally, uh, we have Jen Tirado, who is the Director of Urban Agriculture Initiatives at Green City Force. Uh, she was raised in the, born and raised in the Bronx. She joined the Green City Force in August 2013, where she served as a team leader farm man and farm manager at the NYCHA farm at the Red Hook Houses, which is a public housing facility that has an exciting new farm. She has served in many other capacities. She worked as a green market manager at Grow NYC. She led farmers markets in the Bronx. Um, and she was also inspired to study agriculture and permaculture design um, and the built environment at Marahishi. Is that how you say that? Um, uh, the last name place here. University, where she received a bachelor's of science in, uh, in sustainable living. And so she brings to our panel both expertise in thinking about urban agriculture and translating her degrees into this field, um, and also leading a really exciting uh, green jobs and urban agriculture uh, initiative at their organization. So this is our illustrious panel, and I'm delighted to have you here tonight. Uh, I sent some questions around. Oh, Claude, thank you. Welcome. Oh, sorry. Forgot that we were applauding for each person after their name. OK, so what I'd like to do in terms of our, our panel here is I have asked each uh, person to talk a little bit about their organization. And then I have some specific questions that I'll 
that I'll ask of each person. Uh, and we'll, I would ask if you just hold your questions till the end, we'll have a period for question and answers um, for about 20, 30 minutes at the end. Uh, so with that, maybe we'll just start here and move down if we could. And my first question for you is, if you could just tell us a bit about the environmental focus of your organization or your firm, um, and, and how is social justice reflected or integrated into your work? Do you want to start? And I think we're video recording, so if you can speak into the microphone, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so my organization is Greener by Design. Uh, we are a New Jersey-based organization specializing in energy management uh, consulting. And we work a lot with uh, townships and municipalities across uh, this, uh, the New Jersey. Um, also, uh, some parts of our work include um, Staten Island as well. And um, we, we work on a variety of things, like, um, uh, like Kristen was talking about before. And it covers almost the whole range or the whole spectra of sustainability, from energy uh, to green buildings uh, to brownfields, uh, emissions, uh, monitoring, and things like that. And um, so, so how I got into the organization uh, was with my interest in uh, looking into energy security. And um, that's how I started working with uh, the Hoboken microgrid project. And as all of you are aware that um, Sandy uh, caused uh, uh, Hoboken to kind of fill up as a bathtub. And it was not just only because, um, you know, it had low-lying areas or it was just uh, located like a, a coastal town, but um, also because uh, the substations or the pump stations, they were not working and they were out of power. So um, when we look at like energy security, it's not just providing cities and townships with backup power, but there are also a wide range of benefits um, which range from social economic uh, security, safety as well um, for, the, for the residents of uh, the city of Hoboken. So um, as part of my project, I looked at analyzing how important those benefits are and how can we quantify those benefits. And um, that's uh, one part of uh, looking at also, uh, you know, ensuring the residents are kind of like, um, you know, equipped with not just energy during a critical or a crisis situation, but also overall, if a microgrid is established in their neighborhood, then uh, there is uh, going to be an increase in the number of jobs there, therefore uh, increasing economic uh, security, uh, financial security, and also um, providing uh, critical resources with backup power generation during a crisis would mean additional emergency uh, resources are more more secure. So there's public safety involved uh, and things like that. So that's that's one nature of uh, the kind of work that I, I do. Uh, and I'd like to <laughs> not hold that on for longer. Definitely. Um, I guess I'll just... This is good? I think so. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so I work for... I sort of have two hats going on. Um, I work for uh, Green Thumb, which is the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, but my primary focus uh, within Green Thumb is with Grow to Learn, the School Gardens Initiative, which is a, an umbrella uh, initiative uh, that ho houses two different organizations that help support that or hold that umbrella, so to speak. And the other organization is Grow NYC. Uh, my colleague, uh, Chayvon Cooper, is also with, with, with Grow to Learn and Grow NYC. He's in the back. Shay, wave to everybody. Say hi. <laughs> um, and so... Our primary focus uh, with Green Thumb, uh, our primary focus is uh, school and community gardens citywide, whereas Grow to Learn is only focused on school gardens. Um, so currently I, I serve as an outreach coordinator uh, working with school gardens, uh, as Kristen was saying, in, in Harlem and, and also in the Bronx. I do a little bit in some Staten Island as well, and depending on some projects, every, uh, other places too. Um, but our primary focus is on the over 600 community gardens citywide that Green Thumb works with, as well as over now 564 uh, registered Grow to Learn uh, gardens uh, citywide that we work with. Uh, we provide outreach, education, and technical assistance to these gardens um, in the form of a mini grant, which is up to $2,000 for uh, gardens that want to get started on, the, on new projects, as well as what we call expansion grants. 
uh, to help support uh, their growth um, when they want to take things a step further, um, even in installing things like in, uh, green infrastructure in their gardens as well um, and other projects. Uh, we also provide outreach. So we do uh, workshops throughout the, the year, uh, including even the winter, um, on a wide range of different topics, including composting to um, how to create dye gardens, how you can do art um, artwork in the gardens, um, to uh, similar uh, events like this one. So we had a, a career fair as well um, on, on green jobs in ur urban agriculture um, just a few weeks ago at Brooklyn College. Um, so we sort of do very narrow, like focus on, uh, you know, garden specific work and also zoom out as well um, on some of the broader issues as, as well. Um, and we also try the big, one of the biggest efforts that we do is we try to connect gardeners with one another um, through our events. So we do a, every year we do a school garden social um, where we, that allows uh, school gardeners to connect with each other. Um, some of them uh, more often than not run into each gardeners that they are right around the corner from them um, that they didn't know about. And they're able to exchange resources that way. Um, and then the other thing that we do is we also actually visit uh, schools that want to get into the program, want to start gardens, don't know how to get started, want to try to get their administration on board, um, and are trying to figure out where what they can do and how they how they can do this. And so we, we do visits to the schools, we take a look at their grounds and their spaces and, and try to help them on how they can get those projects um, off the ground. Um, on the, on, by the same note, uh, Green Thumb as a whole also does this same work with community gardens. So, uh, you know, there are residents in local areas um, in their communities where there are vacant lots that they want to develop into a community garden. And Green Thumb uh, also helps those uh, individuals or groups to actually develop those vacant lots into community gardens, as well as sustaining the existing gardens uh, that are in our program as well. Um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I work in the field of urban forestry. And so as many of you may already know, trees provide many vital services to cities. Um, they filter particulate pollution out of the air with their leaves and bark. They reduce temperatures in cities uh, associated with the urban heat island by providing shade and transpiring water back into the air. They reduce um, costs and emissions associated with heating and cooling in buildings. Um, they beautify streets. They make places. Um, they have myriad benefits that really increase quality of life in cities and for urban dwellers. So as an urban forester, it's my job to um, really plan where trees are planted and how they're managed to maximize those benefits for all of the city's residents. And um, I can get into some of the more specific projects that I'm working on right now, but the way that that relates to social justice is that um, historically, uh, environmental resources such as open spaces and trees have not been equitably distributed in cities. And um, when you look at American cities as a whole, you can actually really see patterns of trees and open space um, being centered around people that are wealthier and um, non-minority communities. So in our field, we're really working to um, equitably distribute resources. And um, I think as a new school graduate, I was actually especially qualified to think about those issues. And um, when planning tree planting projects in underserved communities, um, really uh, move away from making prescriptions for what should be there and just putting trees in and um, you know doing what's good for goodness sake and moving towards a, a program that really um, works in collaboration with the community and um, gives power back to the community to participate and plan um, so that there's um, ownership and consideration. Um, so you have a balance between equitably distributing resources and also um, making people feel empowered and included in these projects. I just I want to thank Kristen for inviting us to Green City Force to be a part of this panel. 
Um, so Green City Force is uh, an AmeriCorps service and training program. Uh, so we recruit nature residents, 18 to 24, um, who have a high school diploma or GD um, to become AmeriCorps um, Corps members. Um, to we're rooted in social and environmental justice work. So they um, join the the cohort and they are then tr they track um, into an environmental either environmental social uh, um, justice track, which is either in energy conservation or in urban agriculture. Um, so currently we have some 74 active AmeriCorps members who are from NYCHA housing projects doing service in the NYCHA developments all over New York City. So either we are in doing energy conservation work by educating NYCHA residents, doing door knocking um, through like, you know, through all over New York City and um, educating them on conservation um, because NYCHA residents do not pay for electricity. And so, um, you know, that whole, that whole system plays into the um, environmental issues in general, the, the lack of education. So, um, so we have our AmeriCorps members who are residents supporting the work in their own communities and doing energy conservation work. So that's one, um, so we call it the Love Where You Live campaign. Um, and the Love Where You Live is basically, it's okay to love where you live and um, it's okay to invest in your own community as a resident. And so our core members, we position our core members to be experts and leaders um, of the environmental justice movement in their own communities. Um, and in our urban agriculture uh, track, we build farms, large scale, um, farms in nature developments. We grow three to four tons of food. Um, we started in our Red Hook farm, like Kristen mentioned, the nature uh, farm of Red Hook houses, and that's a one acre farm. And now we are in a half an acre farm in Howard houses in Brownsville. Then we'll move on to the next development, which is in Canarsie Bayview, onward Wagner um, in Harlem. And so our 24 urban farm core members are residents of these developments and they are trained in urban agriculture. So in intensive urban agriculture training and carpentry, um, you know, and obviously in social and environmental justice, um, you know, we're, uh, they're trained in all, everything having to do with um, the social and environmental justice work before they're even trained in the technical piece. Um, so it's about creating the awareness and then creating the expertise to, to support the social and environmental justice work. There's so much more, <laughs> more having to do uh, with the work. There's actually two AmeriCorps members here from the Urban Farm Corps there. So. <laughs> but that's just the, the beginning of like what it all, all is. And we'll, we can get into deeper about what Green Sea Force is. In the next question. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. So, indeed, the next question that I have that I can ask from a couple of different angles, depending on where you're situated within your, your groups or your organizations. Uh, but what skills and expertise do your employees or trainer, trainees have coming into the program? What do you look for in hiring or uh, accepting people into the training programs? Or if you're not in that type of role, uh, what, what do you think were the skills or the, experience, the experiences that kind of got you to where you are? Um, I'll just open it up to whoever feels inspired to respond. So, so the skills and expertise. So we look for um, high school, um, high school and GED. Uh, that's our that's our preference, and that's um, to hopefully influence the the young adults who don't um, who who aren't you know interested in, in getting a high school diploma or DD. Hopefully, that's like their influence to get into you know a program like ours. If college is not if college is not their alternative. Um, and we're also looking for a diverse group of enthusiastic young adults who are interested in being a part of a larger community and being a part of building um, social and environmental justice. Um, we're looking for you know, young adults who um, have various levels of experience so they can all teach each other. Um, and it could be a building of um, expertise and a building of community within the cohort. 
Um, so that's that's that, yeah, for me. Great. Uh, um, I also am the internship coordinator for at my organization, uh, and mostly. <laughs> When we look for interns in our field, we look for diverse backgrounds uh, over the course of spring, summer, or fall. And we look for people of students with backgrounds in uh, public health, public uh, policy, planning, environmental studies, or even uh, sustainability-related studies. Mostly, uh, we do uh, feel that, you know, um, it's it's always good to have, like, an open mind because we, we have, like, such a diverse... Um, set of projects, uh, you know, sometimes uh, the most recent one is uh, uh, that I'm working on right now is looking at changing dimensions for New Jersey uh, school buses um, so that we can, uh, you know, get a greater uh, range of uh, renewable uh, energy and bio biodiesel buses in New Jersey. Uh, so that's that's got like uh, you know when we are pitching something like that for our client, or when we are looking at uh, the health uh, aspects of like uh, the student, the children traveling in those buses, then it's based on a lot of uh, background research, background study, um, and so you know it's just a small example of like uh, how diverse it can be. So we approach mostly these topics from a very macro level level, and then get get down to a micro level at like looking at uh, you know the health hazards or how how many uh, children or adults get affected from diesel fumes for these buses and things like that so I would say um, the number one first thing I think Jennifer you mentioned it already is just like somebody who's passionate uh, who's really passionate about um, whether it be about the work itself or um, just having an impact in their community, um, you know, because we do work directly on, literally on the ground in the, in the, in the soil. Um, and we, but we also work with, uh, you know, if you look at, and it kind of zoom out a, dip, a little bit, we look, we work with uh, a lot of different community groups. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, cross collaboration. So we're looking for, people who are not afraid to get in there and just, you know, you may not know somebody, but you've got to just be be able to put yourself out there um, and tell them about our program, tell them about um, the different uh, services that we provide. Um, so communication skills are, are really key um, in our work. Um, I would also say that having some form of a background in community work is really important. Um, so whether that's actually having volunteered before in um, your own neighborhood um, or in, you know, in, in New York City in general or you know, wherever, just doing some form of stewardship or volunteer work is really key um, because that shows that you, haven't, you, don't, you don't have just an interest in it, but you've actually taken action and you've gone out and done something about it. Um, and you have that experience of having done that. Um, um, another thing, you know, it's also always a benefit if somebody has gardening experience. Um, it's not a requirement. A lot of, there have been people that have come through um, Green Thumb uh, who had no gardening background whatsoever, um, but had a lot of strengths in other areas, um, like the communication skills, like organizational skills, administrative skills, and who did wonderful and learned gardening on the job. Um, but it's nice, it's a bonus, it's nice to have somebody who at the very least is very much interested in gardening, um, you know, is open to learning about gar more about gardening. Um, and then I would also say uh, sort of like a, an intangible is just um, is someone who, again, I guess I mentioned this earlier, but just like someone who's a fearless because our, the work that we do um, we, we're constantly moving, especially during the, the, the growing season right now. Um, there, are always, there are always a lot of things that come up. Um, and I'm sure in all of our work, you know, there, there's different like last minute things that happen. Um, we do a lot of on the ground projects. And sometimes the day before you're gonna be working on a project, you find out that something has changed <laughs> with that project and you've gotta adjust to those circumstances. So someone who's malleable I would call it, or someone who's flexible is also like a really strong skill. Um, and that just kind of comes with um, experience. 
um, you know, uh, but also, you know, it's just kind of a, it's an approach, it's a mentality of being like, okay, well, this has changed, it's okay, we can still work it out, we can still, how, how are we going to move forward? It's already happened, how, we can, how can we move forward and still make this, make this work? So um, that's also something that I definitely look for in, a, in someone who wants to join our team. Great, thanks. Sophie, do you want to add anything from your perspective? Well, I would say I think Rashid pretty much summed it up. <laughs> uh, but um, I would just reiterate that I think um, the technical expertise that um, is required in a job like mine is pretty vast. And um, it's, you know, you need to know a lot about tree species and construction documents and um, just all these, the, the minutia of Arbora culture. Um, but those were things that I really got to learn on the job and I didn't come out of school knowing everything about that. And I'd agree that um, I think when I was hired, I was hired because I was really excited to do the job that I was going to do. Um, and um, communication skills, just to really <laughs> hit that point home, were um, incredibly important and not just, um, being able to um, verbally express the importance of the work we're doing to communities, but also um, creating promotional materials and writing emails. Um, those were things that I really underestimated about myself, but found that they made me an incredibly strong candidate for jobs and really helped me get ahead in my work. Great. I think when we're hearing from everybody there, everyone is that um, skills specific to the job and, and field, but also attitude, so-called soft skills, knowing how to communicate, flexible attitude, being a, being a good colleague. I think that the, it sounds to me like these are the, this is the balance that has, you've looked for in your organizations or have helped you get to where you are which is not uncommon in the job world. Uh, so a little bit of a different question. I began our session by offering some uh, definitions of green jobs. But I'm also curious about whether and how you frame a green job within your organization or a firm. Uh, what is the current thinking both within your organization and, and what do you think if you have any perspective on the whole green economy or green collar jobs? What about the, the prospect for this moving forward in the future? Um, Jen? <laughs> I feel like I'm back in class. I can jump in. Do you want to jump in? I'll jump in. Okay. I got a bunch of stuff written about this. Yeah, oh, um, so, so the first, I mean, this is the question about the prospect, right? I just want to be, make sure I'm sure. clear on it because yeah. I wrote this down. Um, so in the field, um, I think we've seen, and thanks to organizations like Green City Force um, and others that you've mentioned before, um, I think we've got right now, this is my, my opinion, but I think right now we have more jobs specifically in urban agriculture, so I'm gonna speak specifically about urban agriculture than ever before in New York City. Um, as far as being able to do, for instance, like I see postings for like farm manager positions all the time, every week. I see positions for um, different, uh, even like uh, outreach positions similar to the position that I am in, um, mo you know, fairly regularly. I also see postings for um, uh, more technical, so somebody who's like specifically going to be running a greenhouse, um, you know, propagating plants in a greenhouse, and then also doing community work around that greenhouse in communities. I saw a posting about that in, uh, in the Bronx, in the South Bronx specifically, just like last week. Um, so there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of opportunity right now, specifically in urban agriculture. Um, in, in the field, um, but the one of the things that I think is very interesting um, in terms of how we perceive, I would say from the green thumb or from, from the, you know, 
I guess, community or gardening perspective of what a green job is, we're very much like narrowly focused on the land-based work, right? So uh, that would include the trees, you know, tree stewardship, stewardship of the earth itself, and focus on groups that actually want to do that work and helping them to do that work and facilitating that. And so that's very much like our focus of what a green job is. But Kristen, as you were mentioning before, all of these, there's all this other there's all this other stuff out there. Um, and I think a lot of the time green, I don't want to call it green washing or green collar washing. That sounds like a laundromat <laughs> service. Um, but also a job perhaps. It's, uh, we, a job. we kind of get, <laughs> it is. Um, we, we kind of get, I think lost, sometimes we get lost in the shuffle in terms of the, the broader conversation. Like I said, there is a huge amount of growth right now in our, in our field. Um, but in terms of the broader conversation around jobs in this area, uh, green jobs, I think more of it is, is, is revolving around energy, around um, uh, water systems, uh, like larger systems, um, l larger scale, even, you know, uh, planning, the planning field is, is uh, driving, I think, a lot of that and design. And design is actually in this question. And I, t I said, cannot speak to design. I can speak to design when it comes to designing a garden. Um, but in terms of design, when I think of design, I think of um, the kind of design that you might be thinking about when you think about how you might design that bus or the, you know, sort of like larger scale projects that a, DO a Department of Transportation might be doing when they design greenways and things like that. But when I think about design, for my area, I'm thinking about gardens. And um, I have a lot of experience in that area, but I'm not professionally trained. Um, so when I think about that, I'm, I'm more fit focusing on, on, um, on gardens. Um, to me, it's all about the resources. I think that the, the, communities, um, the communities where uh, the need, and we've talked about this already, about where the green space is needed, they're also the areas where the jobs are needed as well. So I think it's really important that they hire locally. Um, thank you for hiring locally. Um, we have historically placed a really strong emphasis on bringing in folks who are, you know, either live in the community where, you know, we're potentially going to be hiring for. So we usually are borough specific. So. We tend to favor someone who lives in the Bronx if they're going to be working with community gardens in the Bronx. Um, and we also f have a very strong emphasis on um, trying to also bring, um, bring folks in that have some, some background in, um, in actually working with the community potentially already that they're potentially going to be, be working in. It, that, that's, it doesn't sound a requirement, but it's definitely something that we take into consideration. Um, we're always looking for more funding, um, as all organizations, I think, doing this type of work are. And we've been really lucky lately um, to fortunate that the city city council actually has provided sustained funding um, to increase, uh, for specifically for lines, for positions in our organization. So we've actually increased dramatically in the last two years um, lines for, for so my, for my my position specifically, there are two people. There only used to be one in our office, and now there are two, which is awesome. So, you know, two people, 564 gardens. Okay, we're, we're getting there. We're working on it. Um, and then, but also for the community gardens as well, we now have two outreach coordinators in the Bronx, two in Manhattan, and two in Brooklyn. So we're making progress, whereas there used to only be one before. Um, and so... We're making progress in these areas, but I think one of the biggest things that I've seen that's coming up, and the organizations, again, that we mentioned before, Sustainable South Bronx, um, organizations like uh, even NYRP, um, they do a lot of this same work as well locally uh, within uh, community gardens and also even outside of community gardens. And we all kind of work together to make it happen. Um, so it's not all about just one, any one particular organization and their growth. Um, at the same time, we are within the Parks Department. So we do a lot of cross collaboration within the Parks Department as well. Um, and so that kind of broadens the definition of a, of a green job for us um, as well. I hope that kind of speaks to um, how, we, how we view the green job field and where it's, where it's headed.
I have two ways of looking at green jobs. And I think about, um, first I think about a job that directly improves the environment. And then I think about jobs directly improving the environment and the people and society. So what we often find, and we have a lot of employer partners um, that we're, we're lucky because um, you know after the core member term is over, um, our next like phase of their term is to assist them in job placement in a green job or um, you know in something that they're really passionate about. So if it's e it's either college or a green job or something in between, at least they carry the awareness of the social justice. <laughs> feel like that, that that aura of social and environmental justice, knowing the movement, learning the awareness of that, so they can take it on, and that could mean that they can, that could be a green job, like having an employee, an employee who comes in having this awareness and applying that awareness to the job that they're working in, if it's not like tech, quote unquote, a green job, working directly for the environment. So we have energy efficiency jobs for Energy Corps. Um, we have employer partners that provide energy efficiency jobs. But are they thinking about the people? Are they advancing, are they advancing their employ, employees? Are they you know, thinking about um, you know, society? Are they thinking about you know, just all these other broader things? Um, outside of like the, the energy conservation or outside of the energy efficiency. So, um, and then the other things that I think about um, when I think about green jobs is a value-based society, thinking about that whole, you know, if Green City Force, we, we don't employ a core, we're lucky to have AmeriCorps as the platform to support the work that we're doing to create pathways towards a green job. Um, so we train in technical training like solar panel installation, energy efficiency, energy auditing, carpentry, urban carpentry, um, you know, extensive urban agriculture, culinary, professional culinary classes for, uh, to, to, to build local foods. So we're lucky that a mayor, we're lucky to have an executive director to have uh, that created who's really innovative in this idea of using national service, AmeriCorps, as a platform to create these pathways. Um, but when I just think about green jobs, I think about there's, it's still, there's different ways of looking at it. So it's something very specific, green job, or is there something like more of a holistic way of looking at it? And that's what, I guess, what Green City Force tries to create is a more holistic awareness of Oh, you know, of, of thinking about a green job and, and, and hopefully empowering our core members to to think about this as they as they continue on in, in their in their pathway um, towards you know towards their next step. So basically, it's really interesting that you phrase it that way because I have experienced a really similar shift in my field, even in just the five years that I've been working. Um, in partnership with or directly for the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, because I work in a, a specific um, division, the forestry division. And um, over the past 10 or 15 years, as the Million Trees NYC program came online and um, more resources were pushed towards tree planting initiatives in cities, um, they, they went from a staff of like 10 people to 60 people. And one thing I've noticed is the people that have been there the longest um, definitely came from the world of traditional forestry. So they got their degrees at forestry schools and did their research in actual forests and then came to New York and started planting trees in the way that they were trained. Um, and the new generation that's been hired in the past five years or so, I would say, has really started shifting the priorities of our whole division um, because they have come into the job um, not as traditional foresters, but rather um, folks that are really in touch with um, the city as a system and um, thinking about how trees play a part in that system and how to be uh, a more urban participant rather than just a, a forester. 
Um, so it's been really interesting to see those two types of jobs kind of um, shifting in a, a really, what I see as a, a really good way in, in the division of forestry at parks. Um, so I wanted to de definitely talk a, a little bit about how I came to doing what I'm doing right now. And that has a bit to do about also greenwashing as a job. Um, and so I started my career uh, working for manufacturing factories in India. And I worked side, uh, side by side with industrial engineers there doing, um, you know, ensuring energy efficiency for factories um, so as to increase their overall revenue. And um, I also have worked on base, uh, like uh, water, effluent water treatment plants there. And uh, from there, I thought, oh, uh, you know, I, I would like to really work at the real top level, working on corporate social responsibility reports for uh, companies that are outsourcing jobs and, um, you know, all these manufacturing in India. Because I had a feeling that, you know, uh, those are the folks that can actually drive, uh, you know, different kinds of environmental related changes or different, uh, you know, uh, uh, overall environmental changes, not just uh, green or not just uh, economic uh, changes, but overall changes. So um, from there, I did uh, my management degree and uh, I went ahead and started working for a sustainability advising firm in London. And uh, I did some reports for Marks and Spencers. They were launching their Plan B at that point of time, and uh, it was pretty exciting. And when I suddenly realized that uh, it's it's not really um, as uh, close to the environment or as close to the kind of field that I really wanted to be in, it it seemed more like drawing up these enormous plans, engaging and uh, you know involving all the people at grassroots level, but that was not really happening, and. Um, that kind of made me, you know, <laughs> that yeah, greenwashing. It reminded me of that, that phase in my life. And uh, then I was here in the new school, and I uh, took up a grant uh, from the India China Institute, and I went to uh, the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau area, uh, so, uh, you know, with absolutely no knowledge about uh, Mandarin, and uh, somehow managed to stay a month there, uh, you know, living uh, with uh, some herding communities. Um, looking at uh, overgrazing in that area, which causes, caused a lot of dust bowls and everything in, uh, you know, the southern part of China. So those, those kind of things, you know, it, it would give you an idea about, you know, there is sustainability, there is green jobs, there is a focus to, you know, improving your environment at every phase, you know, wherever you want to, whichever field you have. It doesn't really matter. It, it, is, it depends a lot and hugely upon like where your interest lies. And um, I, I, I think today that, you know, energy security for me, I really closely relate to it. And there's a tremendous number of jobs everywhere in this particular industry in itself, um, right from like uh, solar panels uh, installation to looking at policy level, making those changes, uh, you know, ensuring that workforce, putting, putting that entire group together. Um, my, my most favorite phrase that I hear from the, the president of my company is that we kind of like cultivate projects, uh, not necessarily we look at, uh, you know, seeing a whole project from day one to the end, but mostly we work with a lot of different engineering firms. Uh, we work uh, side by side with construction, design, build, um, uh, uh, you know, companies. And most of the time, we try to provide them with some sort of sustainability-related advising. And that ranges pretty much from uh, you know, helping them create like an entire sustainable process to uh, looking at providing sustainability-related communications to uh, helping them lead certify their building. If they don't have funding for lead, then definitely following lead guidelines and also uh, kind of uh, you know ensuring that the green building is up to the standards of lead. So those are some of the other aspects from like you know ranging from right from the top down to the to the you know bottom everywhere wherever you can find like you know green jobs for me. I thought I thought so. <laughs> Great. You know, I was um, thinking as each of you were talking, 
I teach a class called Designing Urban Agriculture. And today in class, if any of my students are still here, yes, I see them. Um, we were talking about um, some concepts from Ezio Manzini about everyday designers and this concept of making just making things happen. And I guess I didn't articulate the exact question about design in front of the audience, but I know that you were already prompted to think about this question. And as I was listening to you, I was really thinking that whether or not you're in a design firm or thinking about design as a profession every day, I hear in each of your comments um, this idea of just making things happen. So how do, how do we, particularly, how do we start to shift the green jobs um, sector to, toward being about social justice and about sustainability. And what I hear you saying here is that you're actually just doing that. And, and as that continues to happen with more and more fields, it just builds over time uh, to the point where we see shifts. Or so, Sophie, you were talking about just the shifts that you've seen in your organization with respect to who the foresters are themselves. And so I hear this thread of, of kind of everyday design within the work that each of you is doing. It's very interesting to, to hear about. Well, I think that I have another question, but I think I'd like to first take some questions from the audience before I ask you this final question. Uh, I think we have a floating mic, do we? Uh, so are there questions for any of our panelists about some of their work? Hi. Uh Hi, I have a question in regards to geographic information systems. It's a field that I'm in and have been pursuing, and I'm just wondering if you use GIS, and if so, how you utilize it. Ooh, yeah. Big, big time. <laughs> big time. As Rashid just said. Um, GIS is a huge part of what I do as a forester. Um, so I don't know if you heard about uh, over the past summer, we conducted a tree census, trees count of all the trees in New York City. Um, but we have a lot of other data sets that we use um, for both um, really targeting where we plant trees. So, you know, I mentioned before, there are communities that have been historically underserved and, and have lower canopy cover. The reason that we know that is by using um, geographic information and making maps and thinking about where trees are and where they aren't and where open spaces and um, where the best place to plant trees is. So the data really drives all of the work we do. Um, and then another way we're starting to use um, GIS is to track the work that we've done and show people where we've put resources so that they can um, interact with trees and, and steward trees and track their work. Um, so that's kind of the next step for us. Was that specifically for you? No. Oh. Yeah, so, so we also, um, we don't specifically, like I don't create, I'm not a map maker or, um, you know, I'm not trained in GIS. Um, however, um, we have our friends at Planning and Parklands um, in the Parks Department that do a lot of great work for us um, with making maps and also um, sort of like analyzing spatial data. Um, to look at, especially like particular areas where there are gardens, um, and then also looking at different other layers of, of infrastructure around um, those those gardens and um, how we can line align those things so that um, we can best support those those gardens. So, very basic one is actually just hydrants, right? Like a lot of the gardens rely on fire hydrants to water their gardens when we don't have rain like we had a drought last year and hydrants are really important so um, knowing where those hydrants are in relation to the gardens um, and the distances that they're going to have to um, use hosing to get their water into their garden is really key for us um, and so those are that's one of the projects like that they were able to do with with us uh, last year um, to help us figure out exactly how much hose we would actually require in order to fulfill the demand for, for water um, for our gardens. So, yes. <laughs> long, long story short, yes. For us, I think um, we, we, did, uh, we used GIS for uh, mostly like uh, doing the microgrid pre-feasibility and feasibility studies and analysis in terms of identifying 
um, uh, you know, high energy or low energy areas, public, private buildings, um, connect connectivity, determining the one square mile radius, uh, you know, of uh, low lying or high lying areas that can, can get affected in terms of like a high rain or, you know, like a flood zone and identifying those, those things. Also, like in one of the other projects for Staten Island, where we are looking at Brownfield <coughs> revitalization plan, um, we are looking at parcel, uh, trying to <laughs> create a parcelized uh, mapping structure of sorts to identify which places are occupied, which are strategic, and which can probably, you know, uh, be of value if shifted around and things like that. Um, for for us, we have we're lucky to have NYCHA um, provide us with the space that we we build our farms um, in. Um, so I'm sure they use GIS or some systems to determine that um, because we have to have the right amount of sunlight, the right amount of water source, like that, and um, no slopey or valleys. Um, so, but um, I would like to actually have our core members learn more about GIS. Um, so that's something that I'm interested in, in, in um, like in, in a basics of GIS to our core members, something as a training, because that's it's valuable. So. Great question. We have other questions in the audience. Um, going. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, going off the previous question, can you speak a little bit more about some hard skills that you have found valuable in your work experience or hard skills that you look for in applicants to internships or jobs? And, uh, if you found those uh, either in schooling or in alternative classes, or I know uh, so you work on the job a lot. So, a little bit more to that. Well, I I did learn a lot on the job, but I also learned a lot in while I was at the new school, um, specifically about um, ecological concepts. So that was a hard skill that I still use all the time, just understanding um, the ecology of the city. Um, also, this is very specific to what I do, but tree identification and basic tree care and tree biology were things that I did learn at the new school, um, both by taking an urban forestry class, which at the time was just a, an elective. It was like a Lang outdoors class, odd enough, oddly enough. Um, but that's how I learned to identify New York City trees, which was really useful skill when applying for jobs and starting my job. And then I also took a certification course called the Citizen Pruners mm -hmm. course, which yeah. I recommend to everyone. <laughs> They're registering right now. right now. They start <laughs> next week. It only costs $100, yeah. and it's a five-course um, class. And you learn to prune trees, and you learn how to identify trees, and you learn all about tree care in New York City. And um, it was really inspiring for me. And um, the skills that I learned in that class, I still use to this day. And it was just sort of a, a like fun thing I did on the side. So um, I'm sure there are a lot of other types of kind of informal courses where you can learn those hard skills, especially in the kind of urban ag and forestry world, because there's a lot of hobbyists and people that um, really do this in their free time. And those are good ways to build skills and also you know, through that organization, I ended up doing a lot of volunteering, um, pruning trees and caring for trees. And that was a really uh, great thing to bring into job interviews. I'm really excited because I'm about to do the citizen pruner course starting next week. Nice. So you reminded me of that. I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm also a master. I'm a master composter. Um, and I got my master composter certification with the Lower East Side Ecology Center in Manhattan. Um, but there are master composter sites in every borough. So if that's something you're interested in, it's definitely very useful for me, especially because we do workshops on how you build soils and soil health. And so that's very important um, for me. Um, my background uh, is in biology um, and uh, plant science specifically. So that kind of comes in handy when we're talking about some of the more technical aspects of growing food in New York City. Um, 
and also just gardening, having gardened um, quite a bit, I think also helps. Um, a hard skill that I didn't see coming, um, but that was extremely, it was diff one of the big challenges that I had when I first started working in Green Thumb was actually driving for the city in a city vehicle in a, in a big yeah. truck with double <laughs> barrel wheels in the back. And I didn't, I couldn't, I, I had to learn that on the job, you know, <laughs> basically, I mean, they do a training where you do, you know, with cones and you're learning how to park with cones and then, you know, you drive around the block a few times and it's like, all right, you're good to go. And, but you really don't know until you're in a situation. Um, I just, yeah. real quick story. I had a guy, <laughs> I have to tell this. So I had a guy basically rip part of my bumper off on at a um, pulling out. He was pulling out from the uh, his spot and he like came and pulled my, partially pulled my bumper off um, and then ran. Like he, he left the scene of the accident, of what happened. And I was in the garden and well, what do you do like in that situation? Like, um, and so, I mean, I had to like file a report and, and all these things and it wasn't my fault, but I had to deal with it. Um, it, can, it can be stressful, like driving um, large vehicles, um, but it's the kind of thing that you only, I feel like I wouldn't have really, even if there was some sort of training course in that, I think I only, you have to kind of go through the fire with that so but that's a really it's a really now like I'm very confident and comfortable doing it and I do it all the time and I don't even think about it um but it's something that um I'm kind of proud of that I have that skill because there are a lot of folks even still now you know that are coming in new and they're very apprehensive they don't want to even drive at all even a sedan you know so like and they've got to drive the sedan because that you, you want to get from A to B you don't want to go for take two hours to get to Far Rockaway and two hours back you know um, so that's a hard skill that's really important and they do have defensive driving um, in the parks parks department that helps <laughs> you do your insurance yeah that, exactly. that it's one of the unique aspects of working in New York where people don't always drive right? and we're getting we're getting more and more um, hybrid and also electric vehicles as well so that's really good too I was going to say that in case you are then maybe you should connect something oh yeah we are but we need more <laughs> we need more <laughs> I mean, I, I'm always looking for the, the most like valuable trainings that, um, to, to offer our core members or to partner up with, um, like technical training, uh, programs. Um, and then what we look, so our, there's, there's a person who's in charge of, uh, she's a director of career and alumni services, and she, uh, gathers all this information on how to, like, what are the jobs out there and what's needed. And so we found for our urban farm um, core is um, in, in land improvement and in agriculture is, is, the, is the vehicle um, and just willingness to work in all weather conditions. Um, and, you know, outside of the Green City Force, I started, you know, me with, um, I was lucky enough to, to, to have a position now working in social and environmental justice because it started, I, my first degree is in speech pathology completely was not like what this was. And so I got a second degree um, in sustainable development and sustainable living um, going to Iowa and because of Major Carter. So it started with major, that social justice, like that root was what, like what I, it was like a, uh, aha moment of this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So um, what that that led into growing, uh, working with Grow NYC and just having like just initiative like management skills, working for the for the farm farm manager, like work like literally telling like older farmers what to, like the compliance of like their farms and just like the management, having really good management skills um, and also like like compassion for where they're at and um, just like um, like honest, uh, just honest, um, like being wanting to genuinely build relationships with people. And, you know, that leads to all these um, like great opportunities. Um, but yeah, that's the, the hard skills is the 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 driver's license and the all weather conditions and um, and management, like strong management skills and, you know, just building really strong relationships with people that can lead to like all these other opportunities. For me, it started in energy. And then um, because I knew that agriculture was my focus, I needed to start in energy in order for that to, for me to, for it to lead to agriculture because agriculture wasn't 
what it is now. <laughs> the movement wasn't what it is now. So energy was like the boom. And now it's like there's a shift going on. So that's all I have to say. There's one more I wanted to add, which was um, also very instrumental for me at the beginning. It's not, I would call it a hard skill. Um, so has anybody ever heard of the Just Food uh, Just Food, the organization Just Food? Yes, okay. So they have this uh, program called the TOT. It's called the Training of Trainers. And right when I started at Green Thumb, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to take part in a training of trainers. And what it basically is, is teaching you, and professors, you know about this, the art of facilitation, um, uh, basically uh, popular education. So teaching, being able to teach um, or facilitate uh, learning um, without being all about you. So it's about the people who are learning and that's the focus of, uh, of the teaching um, and learning how to basically uh, build, uh, build, build your, you know, and we doing workshops, that's our bread and butter of, you know, what we do. And, and so doing student focused teaching um, and having that like kind of right off the bat, um, having that training, it's a foot, wonderful training, um, was really key for me and how I, my approach and the lens through, through which I was looking at the work and especially um, how the educational, how, how you teach about gardening and how you teach about whatever the topic may be. Um, because more often than not, most of our gardeners, they already know so much um, and it's just a matter of actually allowing that information to just come out in, uh, in, in the work that we do. Um, so that was something, but that was something that I had to learn. Um, uh, and I'm glad that I was able to, to take that training and, and learn that skill too. Very, very useful. Uh, we talked a few minutes ago about hard and soft skills. And I was also just thinking about uh, a study that I was involved with looking at food food studies programs and what skills graduates would need coming out of these programs in order to get jobs in that field. Uh, and what I'm hearing also is something that was, was found in this study, which was that graduates also need to understand complex systems and processes and have some baseline understanding in the concepts of the particular field. In our case, we're talking about broadly environmental issues. Um, and that dis if I'll call them discrete skills or things like driving a, a city car or you know, doing particular types of uh, forestry skills or something that you can learn on the job, you have to have a baseline comprehension of, of the field itself, complemented by understanding of complex systems because, of course, we live in a complex world and, and, and we need to be able to ad adapt to different situations. So I'm hearing kind of three themes here in terms of the types of things graduates might want to think about as they finish their schooling. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Are there any other questions? If not, I have one. So, OK, here's a question for you that I, you're going to have to go off the cuff because it wasn't something I asked you in advance, which is that though, um, Rashid, you work for a gov government agency, so you may answer this in a slightly different way. But I'm just wondering um, how your work, how much your work intersects with br broader environmental policies, whether this is through uh, policies having some purview over what you're doing, or are you trying to change policy? To what extent do you intersect with the policy world? Um, so I can talk a little bit about one specific project that I'm working on right now that's really being driven by kind of shifting policies. Um, so I don't know if you're aware, but in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, um, there was a historic oil spill. Yeah. And it's a big super fun site right now. So there was a, a seepage of crude oil, um, tens of millions of gallons into the um, Newtown Creek and um, into the groundwater beneath the neighborhood of Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Um, and now that waterway is designated as a super fun site and Additionally, the state attorney general sued ExxonMobil on behalf of the community in order to receive um, reparations for the oil spill. And they won a, a sizable settlement, like $19.5 million. And that money actually went into a uh, fund 
that was administered by the community for environmental improvements in Greenpoint. And so the community was actually able to leverage that money and vote on what types of projects they wanted to see happen in their neighborhood um, and fund them through the environmental reparations grant. Um, and as a result, now I get to work on a forestry program focusing in on that neighborhood and really not just planting trees, but um, educating the community and really um, developing a new participatory process for selecting where trees go and how they're planted that gives the um, decision-making power to the community. And that all came out of this um, super fun designation and um, that really um, spurred the community to start taking um, environmental justice action. Uh, so at least in this case, the policy is what really pushed the community into action and um, created funding for a lot of different environmental improvement projects in a neighborhood that was terribly polluted. So um, I'm not I'm not sure how much um, everybody's aware of uh, microgrids. Uh, as such, but the most popular style of microgrids is basically campus style microgrids. And that's basically looking at uh, backup power generation, storage, uh, integrating a bit of renewable energy in one building. But when we think about community based microgrids, that's a completely new concept. So there's like, um, a lot of projects across uh, New York Prize and a lot of uh, projects that are coming up um, in New Jersey that are looking at exploring that route of uh, campus-style microgrids. It's not a popular phenomenon across the United States, and there's a reason for that, and that's policy. So uh, when, when, the, when there exists like a cap capability to uh, generate power and then share that power between different buildings, and uh, send that power back to the grid, that's what is not written in our current existing policy. So we are kind of like at uh, the forefront of guiding those kind of changes and supporting those uh, changes with uh, research related to like what are the benefits, what could be the possibility in future if certain policy changes were brought into effect so we work very closely with the Board of Public Utilities in New Jersey, uh, the utility provider, which is pac &G. Uh, We also work very closely with uh, the DNOs, which is the distributed network operators, and also the interconnection, the PGM interconnection, to understand what kind of has not led to this kind of policy change happening until now. Why and uh, you know why all these different stakeholders uh, need this change? So we are sitting down with each and every uh, you know stakeholder, sometimes uh, discussing, sometimes going head on in terms of like understanding why not. Um, there's definitely a lot of background to this, and um, hopefully with. Uh, in the interest in you know our states like New Jersey, New York area, these changes will soon be uh, you know there because community-based microgrids is definitely it's you can say like you know you have heard the concept of community solar, it's similar to that but then it has <coughs> way more capability to equip uh, an entire community of say 50, 60 you know critical load buildings. To connect together and you know make a whole township like really resilient in terms of like a crisis situation. So those are the kind of changes that we, we work with. Yep. Uh, yeah, I would say um, there are some uh, previous policies that I can point to that have changed in our world, uh, in our realm of, of of community gardens. One was um, you know chickens are allowed to be. Um, to be re, uh, raised uh, in in outdoor spaces and in, in gardens, uh, only hens, no roosters. Um, that was only, that was a change that came about fairly recently, um, and that was through advocacy work. Um, Just Food worked on that, um, did a great job on that. So we're not in a in an advocacy position, but what we did do was we did a lot of work with Just Food um, back then. So that was like around two thousand eight, two thousand and nine, um, to help support. 
uh, gardens that wanted to raise, uh, do chicken raising and do it the right way. So helping them build out their coops and we help um, put together a city chicken guide and think, and something like that. So we're not allowed to really, we're not in an advocacy position as a city agency. Um, but one I wanted to bring up in terms of something that we're facing now with where we're at now with urban agriculture that's really interesting, but I think is very, it just needs to be addressed somehow, um, which is that we have a lot of brilliant, and I'm sure it comes up in your book. I can't wait to read it. Um, we have a, a lot of amazing heroes, people that I, you know, they're, they're the reason that I do the work because they pretty much put their blood, sweat, everything, their whole lives into growing food for their community. And they, in many cases, are giving away food um, to their community um, and growing, like we said, the social growth that happens through a garden, um, growing community through that work that they do. It, the policy um, issue is that these folks are not allowed to technically be paid or pay themselves through that work. So someone who, let's just say, grows a 1,000 pounds of vegetables in their garden and sells, you know, let's say 800 pounds, and then, and or let's say they sell 500 pounds and they donate 500 pounds. The 500 pounds that they sell, whatever revenues come in from that, technically, based on our policy as our license is written, all that money has to go back into the garden. So they're not allowed to pay themselves through the work that they did to grow that food for their community because technically they're on public property, they're on parks property. However, a way that Many organizations, you know, so nonprofits that are more well healed in terms of administration and, you know, being a, at a nonprofit level, what they're able to do to get around that is that the money is going back into the garden. It's going back into the nonprofit. And then from the nonprofit, they're able to get grants and things like that to potentially pay, pay folks. So what we see there is that there's an in, imbalance, right? Folks that have been doing this work for longer, especially some of the older community who are feeding a lot of people through th that work um, are not able to make, make a sustainable living in terms of financial, and we're talking about jobs. Mm -hmm. So this is a, is a tough issue. And then those that are kind of on the newer you know, newer end of, of urban ag and coming in new in the last like 10, 10 15 years. Um, so when I say old, I'm talking about like the late 70s, early 80s to now. So just to put that into context. And then when I say new, I'm talking about the last 15 years. So those newer organizations are, are able to find ways to have a farm manager come in and pay them through a grant. And we don't really have a policy in New York that would facilitate people to actually be able to farm in the traditional sense of actually being able to take that money and put some of it in their pocket while also, yeah, definitely putting other money into overhead and then you know donating the rest of it. So we need something that can do that because we're what we're doing is I think we're driving a we're, we're driving the ship in a direction where only like nonprofit like organizations, um, professional groups, organizations that have much more in terms of their their capacity to be able to actually pay get people paid to do this work. So that means that all the people that are already doing the grassroots work will have to go to them or create their own organizations to do this. But if we could create a policy that allows them to do it, that would have a tremendous impact on the growth of urban agriculture in New York City and also how sustainable it is. And I, it's great that you brought it back to also thinking about the ways that these policies influence green jobs and who's able to get paid to do this type of work in the city, right? Yeah. Um, well, we're just out of time, and so I want to just ask you each if you could give a point for either a job seeker or soon-to-be graduate or an educational institution about um, how, to, how to grow this green economy or how to get a job. Maybe if you have like a sentence you could share. Get a job. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. That's my thing. When I first got out of college, um, I had a degree in bi biology with focus in plant science. I was like, Mom, I'm getting a job in plant science. I'm going to get a job at New York Botanical Garden in a lab or somewhere that is in my field. She was like, get a job. And I wouldn't listen to her for about three months. And eventually, I was like, you know what? I got to help out. I got to pay some bills here. I got a job as a, as a busboy in a wine, um, wine bar 
in my neighborhood. And so doing, making it happen, right? And three weeks later, I got my interview with Green Thumb. <laughs> it's just taking a step, and I wouldn't have been nearly as confident in that interview if I had a no job. But I had something coming in, it was like, all right, if this doesn't work out, you know what? I just made a waiter. I just That's became right. a waiter. I was gonna start <laughs> to make, I was probably gonna make more than I made a green thumb, but I was doing something that I wasn't as passionate about. <laughs> you so, need a job to get a job. Exactly. Great, get a job. thank you. Okay, so. <laughs> I would, I would yeah. say that follow the policy trends and what's going on with policy. There's still, you know, like the city climate action goals that we need to, there, there's, there needs to, there's people that need to be present and available and know about the work that we're doing. Um, so uh, those, those jobs that are coming um, in the future can be filled. Um, and also, um, j just like she said, the, the, just, get somewhere like get to that volunteer if you have to be a part of the movement be a part of where it's happening um so you it can lead to you know just a great opportunity um but you know and be present have you know network in the same way um that you're doing today like this is just this is the beginning of how much but the jobs are out are out there just have to yeah. yeah. And just to build off that, I'm sure everyone tells you this all the time, but networking is really valuable and um, taking advantage of, if everyone here is going to the new school now, but the new school students taking advantage of your professors because a lot of them have connections in the field. Like that's how I made a lot of my professional connections that I still network with today. Um, people want to hire enthusiastic, excited people, and they want to hook you up, and they want to talk to you about what you're interested in, and people actually like it when you send them emails, <laughs> cold call emails, and say like, hey, I'm a new school senior, and your job seems really interesting. Can I buy you a coffee and ask you some questions? So do like three or four of those. Those are great yeah. suggestions. Great, great segue. That was, that was what I was going to say is that the thing I miss most about being in school is the innovation and the out-of-box thinking. You know, when you work, get into work life, it's like every day, this project, that project, this thing, that thing, this is a system, this is a decorum. But there's no out-of-the-box thinking. That's what students bring best, and that's why people look forward to those kind of, like, innovative thought processes. So keep that going, you know. That's what's going to get you out there. Or create your own jobs. Yeah. Or create your own jobs, if you're able. Well, that's a nice, bringing us back to a theme at the new school, thinking out of the box. So thank you all very much for taking time to speak with us tonight. And thank everyone for coming. I hope you've enjoyed the event, and have a wonderful evening and great Earth Week. We have many Earth Week events happening at the new school, so make sure that you take part in as many as you can. Thank you.